Disney CEO heir apparent departs in what amounts to a big shakeup at the House of Mouse on this consumer goods edition of Industry Focus. Greetings, fools. Sean Riley here at Fool Headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. It is April 5th, 2016, and joining me in studio is the indispensable Vincent Chen. What's up, man? How are you, Sean? Not too bad. How are you? You excited to talk about this story? This, uh, you know, I walk in this morning, and I think I got a some sort of push notification from Bloomberg News the last 24 hours, and I'm like, oh, that's a big deal. But then I walk in, and uh, you sent me that awesome article from, I think... New York Times? Maybe the LA Times. Anyway, um, you sent me an awesome article detailing it, and you know, I start reading it while sipping my coffee this morning, and I'm like, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. This was the guy that beat out the former CFO. Um, it was a Jay Rasulo? Yes, that's uh, correct. I apologize if I butchered the last name there. Um, he beat out the CFO for this chief operating officer role, and uh, he was expected to take over from um, current CEO. Um Bob Iger, in uh, and he's supposed to step down in two years. What June twenty eighteen or something? That's that's when his contract ends. Yep. And um, it's you got to wonder what was going on behind the scenes. Um, I mean, we can speculate, but you know, I you know, I guess we'll never know unless somebody writes a book someday. Ah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so what did you you did a lot of uh, background research on what was going on with these guys? Um, I, I did a decent amount myself, but I'm anxious to hear what you found. Sure. So. Uh, just to you know, uh, I guess give some context to, for our listeners. A big major reason I wanted to to talk about this today is obviously leadership after Bob Iger. You know, t whoever takes the helm for Disney, that's really important to the current shareholders. If you're thinking long term, you want to know if that capable management is going to be in place. I say most people over the past decade have generally been very appreciative of the job that Bob Iger has done with certain really key acquisitions, expanding to certain businesses. Just doing an incredible job. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you're talking about buying Marvel. I mean, all we'll, the stuff he's done. Yeah, yeah. we'll I'd totally get to that. Because Staggs also had a hand on a lot of those projects as well, and those deals, especially when he was previously CFO for, I think, like 12 years. Mm -hmm. But this also is just a really interesting intersect, I think, of not only you know the business side, but also some of the you know personnel challenges that uh, you you know you mentioned to me before the show. Some other famous companies that have run into problems and in management shakeups when it comes to the succession to the coveted CEO role. Run, running a company is not all sunshine and roses, despite what many think. <laughs> uh, so. You know, personally, for Thomas Staggs, you know, he announced that he, I think he'll be stepping down in May, uh, though he will f serve out the rest of the fiscal year for Disney as like a special advisor. Yeah, to the CEO. To Iger. Yeah. Um, and, you know, before Staggs even, you know, he joined Disney in 1990. And before he did, he was in Bank Am, Morgan Stanley. And when he did join, uh, at this point, what, like 25 plus years ago, he was a manager of strategic planning. And his, his rise through the company was really rapid. Uh, he became a senior vice president of strategic planning and development in 1995, so five years later after he started. And he rose to senior executive vice president and CFO by 1998. So within eight years of joining the company, you know, he had taken He's on the CFO, CFO role. Yeah. And so he served in that role for about 12 years. And as you mentioned, during his time as CFO, he was in, uh, you know, on his bio, I think they mentioned specifically some key deals that he was involved in. So the first one was the oldest one, really, is Capital Cities ABC acquisition. So we know how significant that was. That was announced in August 1995. So you know, before he took over the CFO title officially, but you know, obviously, I'm sure he was involved. Um, otherwise, you know, they wouldn't mention that. But uh, you know, it's a 19 billion dollar acquisition at the time. I think it was the second largest corporate takeover in history and you know this is a really big moment for Disney cuz you know they combine essentially their content creation resources with the worldwide distribution that ABC and Capital Cities enjoyed and of course this is the deal that landed them ESPN which now we know is it's their cash cow their financial engine i mean it is i you can't overstate enough how important it is there's a reason it... why last august when Iger came out and basically said, hey, we're experiencing some losses with ESPN and some of our other cable properties. You know, 
all these freak media, out. the entire freak industry out. took a hit with all the stocks falling. You know, it's Disney shares were at over one hundred twenty dollars, I think, and then when that news came out, they plummeted and they've kind of roller coastered since then. They're trading a little over ninety dollars now. When you see, uh, you know, Disney's market cap right now is uh, one hundred fifty seven billion. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but ESPN's valued at like fifty. I mean, huge it's, part of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, anyway, so that you know that was uh, one of the main deals, uh, one of the first deals mentioned. But Stag was also involved in Pixar, and so that was announced in January 2006. So you know, as a CFO at that point, he was uh, he was very much active. I'm sure in the deal making process. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, Iger actually just taken on the role of CEO a few months earlier before the Pixar deal, and so. So, am I correct in saying that Staggs was the guy that issued all the stock to <laughs> to uh, Steve Jobs with the Pixar acquisition? <laughs> yeah, actually, probably. But uh, you know, Iger he had mentioned at the time of the deal that he wanted to refocus the company on a lot of its animation roots because at that time, you know, there was a lot of competition coming. From, I think it was from like Pixar, DreamWorks. Dream, yeah, you know, Pixar had huge hits like think Toy Story, Monsters Inc., Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, and. You know, Disney paid seven point four billion dollars for the animation studio, and since then, you know, the Pixar has been involved. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> been involved in about ten films since that deal was announced, and those films have grossed about six point five billion dollars worldwide. And that doesn't even begin to include the amount of like merchandising tie-ins, tie-ins to their theme parks. And, you know, they've had in- huge characters since the deal closed. Like, think Wally. Uh, you know the close out of the Toy Story, tr- Toy Story trilogy, Monsters University, things like that. Did I tell you um, what I witnessed at the line to see the Easter Bunny a couple of weeks ago at the mall? What did you see? They so in, of course in the winter time in the same spot they had the you know Santa and they had um, frozen stuff everywhere. Of course, of course. But they still had like frozen posters off to the side to see the Easter Bunny, and they're just. You know, little girls were like, "Oh my!" Like, yeah, I'm sure it. it it's incredible. It's, yeah, it still blows my mind the long tail that Frozen has had in terms of its. You know, the movie came out what 2014, I it's, think it was. Yeah, and it. You know, people, kids are still crazy about it. I, you know, I know the sequel's coming. I'm not sure on the ex- expected release date, but it's incredible how the pro- the you know, the toys and everything have continued to be so popular you know with the holiday shopping list frozen was still like towards the top in terms of most popular toys but uh you know going moving on so another deal another two deals that i quickly want to touch on that stags was involved in during his time as CF, uh as CFO. cfo first was marvel entertainment so you know think about this august 2009 disney goes shopping again they pay four billion dollars for this you know library of super famous characters yeah, and all these things we're talking about are what first come to mind when you talk about Disney today. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's anyway. Yeah. So uh, you know, I think you know ultimately what I'm trying to get is just how uh, you know Sachs' tenure at the company has been through major, major changes, very dynamic, and overall like big, uh, big acquisitions or expansions that a lot of people would say are a significant reasons why the company is so successful today and uh, you know the Lucasfilm deal was uh, after Staggs had moved on from the CFO role to become I think it was chairman of Parks and Resorts is the mm-hmm. official title but uh, I just wanted to touch on that really quickly because you know they made that purchase similarly like Marvel for about four billion dollars Force Awakens itself generated two billion dollars in worldwide ticket sales and that's the first movie in the installment I'm very curious I, I would actually kill to know how much um, how he figured out what to pay for these things I would love to know that so I, I think it's gonna involve you know all these deals involve a lot of bankers a lot of people you know discounting cash flows and things I've seen the valuation models not necessarily in the entertainment side but mm-hmm. in, an, in other industries and that's Often, how it comes down to Lucasfilm was especially interesting because you know it was solely owned by George right. Lucas. George Lucas, yeah. So he's you know he just got a ton of Disney shares. I think he became like the largest non-institutional shareholder after Steve Jobs' after wife. the Steve yeah. Jobs <laughs> Trust, right? And so 
uh, you know, for the most recently reported quarter, you know, this Lucasfilm deal, four billion dollars, Disney boasted a forty-six percent year-over-year revenue increase in the studio entertainment segment. Operating income for that segment was up eighty-six percent, and then the consumer products and interactive media segment also saw operating income increase twenty-three percent. And basically, they acknowledge the fact that this is all on Star Wars mania. So. You know, you hear about all these huge deals that Stags was, you know, part of, and then also I think it really highlights like these are some of the deals that Iger like. This is his vision, mm-hmm. and I think a big reason why this is big, uh, why this is such important news for shoulders is, you know, when Stags took over as COO last, you know, I think it was early last year in February. People saw him being, you know, the natural uh, person to step in once Iger retired, and Everybody's going to be comparing him to this to, to a man who changed the company and really took it to the next level. Cool, and that's how that's why this decision is, is really making the news rounds and just a really important part of what the long term future could be like for the company. Yeah, so uh, I definitely want to move on to his time at uh, Parks and Resorts because he crushed that role. Oh, absolutely. Um, but before we do, I want to point out to our listeners that April is Financial Literacy Month. And in that spirit, we are actually giving away 10 books to 10 lucky winners. Um, these books include favorite financial picks from David Gardner, Morgan Housel, and Industry Focus's own Christine Hargis. Uh, to enter to win, just go to podcast.fool.com and click on the yellow Super Podcast link up at the top of the page. Once again, that is podcast.fool.com. Um, so Vince, um, before we came in here, I, I went through the last five or six years of 10Ks to look at the uh, Parks and Resorts segment at Disney, and you know, I from just cursory knowledge, I knew going in that they were probably going to be really good. Um, did not know they were going to be as good as they turned out to be. So you know, as we mentioned, Stags stepped uh, switched his roles actually with that person that you mentioned earlier that he beat out for the COO jobs, Jay Rasulo, I think his name was, and uh, so they switched roles. So Stags became went from CFO to Chairman of Parks and Resorts. In that time, just to give you an idea of some of the things that he was involved with, responsible for, you know, that segment includes a global team of about one hundred thirty thousand. Which is employees. probably their biggest employee base, I would think. I believe like, so, actually. Yeah. Anyway, and. In that time, in that five years, from 2010 to 2015, he he also oversaw massive projects. Think Shanghai Disney, right? I think they broke ground in 2011. That's huge, five billion dollar investment. You know, largest international investment I think Disney's ever made. Period. And then you have ex- huge expansions of parks that were already existing. Think like the Avatar theme land at Animal Kingdom. Uh, they open a spa and resort in Hawaii. They have new lands in Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong Disneyland, and you know expansions of a lot of the parks. And as you, like you mentioned, so when it comes down to the numbers, you know, uh, fiscal year 2010, park, parks and resorts revenue was about 10.8 billion dollars. Operating income about 1.3 billion. And that was actually down from 2009, from what I saw. But anyway. so five years later, uh, during Stag's tenure, revenues up 50 percent. And operating income is up about 130 yeah. percent, um, and this is keep in mind this is for Disney's second largest segment. It's not like they were growing from a really small base. Right now, as of the most recent fiscal year, Parks and Resorts makes up 31 percent of the top line, whereas Media Networks makes up 44 percent. In any so of pretty your, close second. In any of your research or reading, did you get? Um, any kind of read on why Stags went to Parks and Resorts? Was it like, hey, this segment isn't doing so hot? You're my guy. I need you, or do you know what? I actually did not see, but um, I think overall, like you know, in terms of his background, a lot of people on Wall Street have all very had a very positive view of him. So again, when the news came out, like oh, COO position, heir apparent, like it was very positive. I think here, you know, before it was in a CFO role, maybe more in his wheelhouse. Previous what he was doing in terms of banking, taking on this more like uh, this more operational role as head of parts and resources, it kind of like proves. It, it was yeah. like proof, like, hey, he can run all these different businesses. If in, I wonder if that's if it what comes he was thinking race. or something like that. You know what Potentially I mean? Potentially so. And so, you know, that group has had record performance, um, and Bob Iger's acknowledged that as well. That how incredible a job Stags did during his five years heading that up. And so now we come to the, you know, to this position now where you know he served as CEO for just. About a year at this point, I a think. year and a half, he and was, now he's announced yeah. his. You know, he's stepping down, and 
you know, a lot of people are, are there's been some sources in the reports I've seen, like LA Times, Wall Street Journal, that there's a lot of pressure actually from the board of directors. So, you know, the questions come up. It's like, why did, you know, basically Iger groomed him and chose him like, hey, this is guy's right. going to be COO. If you go to the management page on the Disney Investor Relations website, even the way it's presented, it looks like that's the case. You have Bob Iger at the top, right next to him is Stax as COO, and then everybody else is below them. It even like, you know, visually that that seems like to be the case. So the board of directors was fine then, but now you hear that certain members of the board were uncomfortable with him, didn't think he was actually a good choice anymore. Did you come across pressured. any names? Wink, wink. And this is where we kind of come to the interesting, you know, crossroads here of what happened behind the scenes, and also who now is going to be considered as a candidate. Uh, so, just to give you some uh, background, like you know, the board of directors has some incredible names. Bob Iger's on it, obviously. Susan Arnold from Carlisle, John Jen, BlackBerry CEO, Jack Dorsey of Twitter and Square fame. Uh, you have also, you know, Alwyn Lewis, who's CEO of Potbelly, I think, right now, and Mark Parker of Nike, of course, and Cheryl Sandberg. So I mentioned her last, and because she is actually, you know, there's uh, obviously rain now. Some of this is rumors, but there are. Some reports saying that you know she's potentially angling for this position, uh, wanting to move out of you the shadow. You think she might want it? Of Zuckerberg, moving out of the shadow of Zuckerberg at Facebook and kind of like proving her chops, taking over the CEO role right now, the, mm-hmm. by far the biggest entertainment company around. Uh, so you know that was something that was potentially you know hinted at from some of the sources that were reported. But another possibility here is and. Because you know markets reacted pretty negatively to the news, you know obviously a one day short term drop, but still I think people were otherwise very happy with the succession plan having Stacks fill in. Mm-hmm. But now they're saying, well, you know Iger's already extended his contract twice. He's sixty five. Yeah, he's supposed to retire in June twenty eighteen. He wants to enjoy his hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> Isn't it? Is it possible that he just extends it again? I think two years honestly is plenty of time for them to find a potential candidate. But right. at this point, you know, after that race in twenty fifteen between Rasulo and Stags to fill the, the COO role to be the heir apparent, you know, a lot of strong candidates within the company have left already, mm-hmm. knowing that you know the that ladder up is filled essentially. So, if it you know Iger isn't extended, and you know it's not from an a interesting internal pers- uh, position like Sandberg, for example, from the board, it'll have to be an external candidate, and that opens up uh, to opens the company up to a lot of different questions, uncertainty. Will they f- be able to manage a company with so many different businesses? And so, it's, it's an interesting question. It makes me wonder because presumably and. Uh, please give me your thoughts as well. Um, it seems to me like you know you're talking about the board not liking Stags, even though he's clearly Iger's buddy and they've worked together for 10, 20 years on all these deals, Marvel and Star Wars and all this stuff. Um, it makes me wonder if it has something to do with uh, Disney's tradition of kind of putting a creative person in the CEO role. Um, even Michael Eisner, who, uh, fun fact, he's one of the only people that have ever gotten on the Forbes 400 list of richest Americans. He's worth a billion dollars uh, solely by not owning a company, but from salary and stock option compensation. Oh, really? He's one of the only because every think about it, everybody well, he else. Had a, in the, he had a pretty long run. As he did, head of C- and of every Disney. year he got a lot of stock options. But he didn't. My point is, he didn't. You know, build a business like mm-hmm. Bill Gates. Or, you, you see what I'm saying? I understand. Anyway, yes. One of the very few. Be- anyway, um, he ran ABC early on in his career. Um, you know, Iger obviously he ran. He was also uh, yeah. involved with ABC. And yes. you, you you see what I'm getting at here? And I wonder if even though Iger probably at some point was like, yeah, Stags, if you know you you. Crush this parks and resorts thing, uh, you know they'll they'll know that you can run it and you're my guy and all that stuff. I'm wondering if it finally came to a head to where you now we really still want a creative person, which I'm wondering if uh, Cheryl Sandberg would have the same flaw. Well, the actual the thing is, and I'm really glad you brought this up because I I had wanted to mention this and I'd forgotten, but. Okay, so if you look at it right, like I love you, Cheryl. I don't mean to poo-poo your you have, odds. You know, <laughs> the the candidate can you know 
their ultimate focus, I think I, they obviously want somebody who's well-rounded, but you know, you either have somebody who's really well-versed and experienced, has the right connections on the entertainment side, and then, or you have somebody who's more focused in terms of like the finance side, the operations. Which is clearly stacked. But then you also have somebody, you can have somebody who's more focused on the technological side, and that's where a candidate like Sandberg Oh, in fill the role. It's 2016. We need a tech person. We need a social. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Like, what's you know the issue last year that really hurt Disney share price is what is going on with ESPN? Can that is that something ah. can be sustainable? And what have been the what has happened that has caused like a lot of pain for the cable TV industry? And that's the rise of a lot of tech new tech options like streaming and we're going to need uh, to do know, virtual reality boxes. which so, facebook happens to own does that Oculus mean Rift. that you know perhaps the shift is moving away from somebody who was able to blow parks and resorts out of the you know right. do a great job there but instead reshift that focus to somebody who can think more about the future and where the company needs to go in order to stay at the top of the heap that it is right now got it cool all right well thanks for your thoughts vince thanks, this is good Sean. stuff have a good one and if you're a loyal listener and have questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Just email us at industryfocus at fool.com. Again, that's industryfocus at fool.com. And as always, people in this program may have interest in the stocks that they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against those stocks. So don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear in this program. For Vincent Shen, I am Sean O'Reilly. Thanks for listening, and Fool on! Fool on!